Hi and welcome. I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, Presbyterian Minister of three congregations in Eastern Ontario, these three, and thank you for joining us for this week's uh, Bible study on the book of Revelation, or a summary of the Bible study on the book of Revelation. So as we've done in other weeks, we we focus on one section. So right now we're working on chapter four. We're going to be looking at some of the images in chapter four, and then we step back and see what's going on in the drama of chapter four. So I encourage you to get a Bible, uh, get some coffee and get a notebook and be prepared to pause the video at every so often to do some research for yourself. So let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the chance to uh, learn more about your word. And we ask you to silence in us anything that would distract us or lead us away from you. And please send us your spirit that we can read your word and understand what you are trying to tell us. May, us, may our ears be open, our hearts be open, willing to accept your guidance. But we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so as I said, symbolism is extremely important. And we, we jump into this, uh, Revelation 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and there in heaven, a door stood open. So we've got this open door at the beginning of this section. So verses, chapters 2 and 3 focus on letters to the seven churches. Now it's different. And so then we've got a window while a doorway into heaven. What's going on? So step back and think about it. the image of the door has shown up in chapter three as well. So look at chapter three, verse eight, chapter three, verse 20, chapter four, verse one, and ask yourself, what are these doors and what is God trying to tell us with these doors? And while I do that, uh, you can pause the video and I'm going to share the screen. So just a moment. So Revelation 3 verse 8, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you kept my word and not denied my name. And of course, one of the more famous verses from the whole Bible, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. And now it's, I read in uh, Revelation 4, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, or as I said here, there in heaven, a door stood open. What is going on? Why this image of the door? What is God telling us? So when we discuss this in our Bible study, one person said, it's a door of opportunity. And I have to admit, I was floored because I had never looked at the door that way. I saw it as, in a sense, free will. God giving us the choice. Well, it turns out that's how the other person did too. It's a door of opportunity. God does not push us. He doesn't force us into that door. It's an open door. It's no one's going to shut it. It's there open for us. And yeah, we don't have much strength. We can't get through that door on our own. We may not even be able to crawl through it because of whatever's going on in our lives. Don't worry. Take your time. God's not going to shut it on you. Whatever strength you've got, The doors open. Come as far as you want, when you want. Even when it's the door of our heart, God's not going to force his way in. He stands at that door and knocks, let me in. We have that choice. Do we want to open the door for God or not? And it's like I, I, I say, okay, he's opened the door. I've invited him into my home my heart. And then there's a part I don't want him to see. And I'll just say, no, I'm putting the door, I'm closing the door. I don't want you to see the mess in that room. 
And you know what? Jesus respects it. He doesn't go in there. But you, every so often I'll hear, can I come in now? Can I take a look? It's a door of opportunity. But over and over, God's telling us, I am not going to force you. I am not going to ram what I want down your throat. It's that gentle, small voice. It's that push. It's that door of opportunity, but it's your decision. Always, it's always, always, always. It's your decision. Do you want to go through or not? If you need help, I'm here to help. Just ask. Now you might say, wait a second. I seem to remember there was, you know, a little guy called Saul of Tarsus and he didn't exactly ask God to come into his life. He sort of was thrown off a horse and blinding light. Yeah, okay. God can do that and has done it. But that's not, let's face it, most of us aren't going to be the kind of people like Saul of Tarsus was or Paul as he came to be known. We're not going to be that important in the Christian church and, and that famous. But even though Jesus sort of knocked Paul for a loop, at some point Paul did have free choice, but that's Paul. But for us, it's going to be that, can I come in? Or here's the door to heaven. I want to show you something. Come, let me show you. Come, enter, but it's up to you. So it's something to remember. There's these doorways into God's world. And God will invite us, but it's always our choice whether we will take advantage of that opportunity or not. As the passage goes on, sorry, I will have to get this up again get my bible here chapter four it goes on at once i was in the spirit and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on it let's see and the one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald so this image is a rainbow. What's going on here? Stop and think about that. What's going on with that rainbow? Well, they take back to Genesis and Noah, Noah's Ark, so all the way back to the story of Genesis. And if you remember after the flood, God put a rainbow in the sky and it was a promise I'm going to establish this rainbow. It's Genesis chapter nine, verses 13 or so. I've set my bow in the clouds. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow, rainbow is seen in the heavens, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again will the waters destroy anything. So we have got God sitting in heaven and there's the sea of glass and this rainbow surrounds him. It is a promise. God remembers his covenant with human beings. He remembers his covenant with Noah. He remembers that he will never again destroy the world by floods, by waters. That he has committed himself to being involved in our lives. So right here at this beginning of this vision, and we know there's going to be all sorts of horrible things, but we have this two promises. The door is open. It's open for us two ways. 
to let God into our lives and for us to come into heaven. And God remembers he has committed himself to us. So whatever else happens in that future, don't worry about it. Something to wonder, to be thankful for. There's also the number seven. So again, stop and think about, go through chapters one to four and note down all the different times that seven is being referred to and what's happening with the seven. And when you're ready, come back. So those were some of the sevens that I picked and, and I may have missed a few. And certainly we know there's going to be more sevens coming. So seven is a very holy number. If, if you did a Google on seven in Judaism, you'll find there's, you know, the seven days of creation, the Sabbath is the seventh day, the seventh year is a sabbatical, the seven, uh, seventh period of seven years is a jubilee, that's the 49 years. If someone dies, you do shiva for seven days where you're sitting and basically just talking about the dead person and how often seven shows up in um, holidays, like Passover, Hanukkah, Sukkot, some of the others. Uh, you've got the uh, lampstands, the menorah. Uh, you've got um, uh, the seven blessings, seven names of God. So seven is a very holy number. Here we're told the seven churches. Uh, we had the letters to the seven churches, the seven spirits of God, the seven lampstands. And we're told that the churches are the lampstands, the seven stars. And Jesus holds the seven stars in his hand. And the seven stars are the angels who are protecting the churches. So Jesus is holding the stars and walking among the churches. But here in the next chapter, he is holding the stars and the spirits. So it's Yes, things can get worse, and we know that some of the churches were really bad. But Jesus is still there in the churches, and his authority is growing, his power is growing, and we start seeing that fusion more and more between Jesus and God. And one of the things here in chapter 4 that really stood out for me, the lamps are the spirits of God. The lamps are or the light of the world, it's Jesus. And lamps get held on lampstands. So we, the churches, are the lampstands, and we are to hold God's light, Jesus' light. And we are to let that light shine in the world. So if ever you wonder, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be the church of God on earth? We are the lampstand holding Jesus and letting Jesus' light shine in the world. God's light shine through us. Unfortunately, as the letters to the seven churches remind us, we have often failed. You might keep track of the number four. And certainly we do have the thing of the four beasts. And so if you want to look at those four animals or four beasts, what are they? You can look up Ezekiel, those are the references, and also some of the Gospels. And I just want to show you, because this becomes important. If you Google, sorry, I'm going to share this, uh, this site. If you Google Ezekiel's vision, Look at some of those images that you pop up. The, the descriptions in Ezekiel, you know, got four beasts or heads or whatever, and they're very strange. And you see here, it's sort of like on a God maybe sitting on the throne surrounded by cherubim. Here it's we're, we're on the outside looking in, and you've got wheels within wheels. Here you've got wings uh, into the uh, locking wings, so many images based on these Ezekiel passages, and they're so different. 
And that's something to hang on to. And I, I, I just wanted you to think of that. In Daniel, we have the same thing, winged animals. And again, these descriptions, that fourth beast, it's never quite described in Daniel 7. And again, how different is it? Uh, we've got these images here, many heads, a dinosaur version with many horns. How different that is. We've also taken to seeing the Gospels as, as different uh, images of, of animals. And so you'll have an ox or an eagle, uh, oh, sorry, a human being, an eagle. I guess this is a, a ox and a lion. And what's going on? What gospel is represented by which animal? And uh, you may not be aware of it, but take a look at some of the stained glass windows in churches. Um, you, you might see some of these symbols floating around and just wondered what they represented. And now you know, and they're coming from the uh, chapters like Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation. So to go back to our PowerPoint, in some cases, Matthew is, and, and people don't always agree. The, the one that most people seem to equate with the eagle is John. Like he's you know, off the wall a bit. Uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And, and you're sort of going, okay, what does all of this mean? And you start saying, yeah, I'm sort of like being transported to a different reality. So Eagle and John seems to be pretty easy to go together. With the others, it's a lot more difficult. So Jerome put Matthew as a man, a human being. And uh, we see that, you know, he see him from being a baby to dying. Mark is a lion because he's like a warrior fighting. And, and the gospel is very much, God. Jesus is very dynamic in here. And Luke is a calf. Well, you've got the shepherds and the ox and, you know, sort of nice and he's cuddling the sheep. So, so that's what Jerome had. Gregory the Great, great saw Matthew as the lion because there's a lot of Jewish references and Jewish symbolism built into the gospel of Matthew. And we talk about the lion of Judah. Mark is an ox because it's very strong in poles. And Matthew is the man, uh, sorry, Luke is the man because we see a very human Jesus there. So, you know, there's no right or wrong. And that's one of the things, just sort of realize we've got these images and it's not this equals that. There's a fluidity here. But where is any of this coming from? Some of this comes from the Babylonian exile. So Ezekiel, Daniel introduce it. But the Babylonian artwork, we have here a, a human face, maybe with ox horns, I'm not sure, and wings and a bull. So it's built on this artist picture that comes out of Babylonian art and it just sort of soars and takes off. So then you've got some of those pictures. Something else to remember. Going back to Exodus, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay, so in Judaism, even today, there's a reluctance to say the name of God. And actually, to even say one of the titles of God, you tend to avoid it. And in popular speech, you won't even say the Lord God, you'll say the name, Hashem, the name. Or if in writing, you may see this in some Jewish writings, they won't even write the word God because it's holy, it's so sacred. And we see traces of this in the book of Revelation. Remember, John is a Jew 
and he's writing to Jews as well as to non-Jews. And so he brings in this, these elements of Judaism. And so God is referred to as the voice, the one on the throne who is and was and is to come, first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the seven spirits, the seven fold spirits. So just sort of take a note, jot down some of these expressions for Jesus, for God, things that, you know, you aren't referring to them directly. But when you stop and think, yeah, we're supposed to remember this really is God. Other references, <clears throat> sort of John is that bridge. And so you might take do uh, some work here. Pause, look up these passages. So in Revelation 4, uh, verses 2 and 3, we have God sitting on that throne. And other references where it's very clear, God is the one on the throne. In Revelation, it's one sitting on a throne. For non-Jews, you stop and think about the Greeks and the Romans. What did they have? Well, of course, they had the image of Caesar on the throne and also Jupiter or Zeus on the throne. So again, someone very powerful sitting on that throne. God of God, king, power, heavenly image. This is a vision, not of some, you know, well, yeah, I had a vision. Uh, I saw myself on a bridge and I'm, I'm eating an ice cream cone. No, this is a vision. I'm before the throne of God. And we've got this heavenly court. It's 24 beings. What are the 24? Is it the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles? So the Old Testament and the New Testament? Is it 24? As you find out in uh, Chronicles, is you actually, the priestly courts, they ended up with 24 divisions. So is that the 24 divisions of priests surrounding God? Is it the angels and the priests, the elders? Who are these officials in God's court? And then, of course, we also have references to Satan in God's court in Job and uh, I believe Isaiah. So wait a second, what's Satan doing there? And that's tip off. We're in this heavenly court. The doorway's open, but we already know there's persecution. We already know that there's suffering going on. Now we're going to see the place that suffering has in the grand scheme of things. And the clue is heavenly court. And look who's there. Satan. Prolog. Dramatic pause. So those are some of the images close up. Let's step back. Here's a picture of a Greek theater. And of course, if you know something about Greek theaters, the action, well, such as it is, the actors are down here, the audience is here, and the acoustics are so remarkable that you can hear a pin drop here, but you don't hear the ocean. It's so close. This is at Caesarea. Do some research about what Greek theater was like. You might want to Google the Trojan Women. Uh, it's a movie that was made in the 70s with Catherine Hepburn, Vanessa Redgrave, and Genevieve Bougeau and Irene Pappas. Very powerful movie um, in terms of Greek theater. Very boring movie in terms of what we're used to in Western theater. What you have is a chorus in the movie, it's Chorus of Women, and they are going to be repeating things, they're going to be singing, they are moving the drama along with some narration. And then you have one or two people speaking, not necessarily speaking with each other, 
but to the audience, they're proclaiming, they're making speeches. Any action is usually off stage. In Greek theater, you would have the words describing what's happening and the picture of what's happening is left in our imagination. Over and over again, we have in the book of Revelation symbols. Some of them are explained because it's too bizarre. We need some guidance, but others are, are left fluid. It's your imagination. Look at the story. What is happening? Don't try to say this equals that, and this is going to happen before that, and it's this day and that day. No, it doesn't work that way. And if you want some guidance to just get some help understanding this, here's one of my favorite websites when dealing with the book of Revelation. And you, it's religioustolerance.org. Just Google it. And Google T-O-T-T-E-O-T, Teotwaki, okay? which is simply the end of the world as we know it. So the end of the world as we know it. And at the very bottom of the page, they have re uh, uh, recent prophecies, prophecies of the end of the world that were predicted to happen. And it's pages, pages of prophecies. How many prophecies? were issued before 1921. The end of the world was 30 AD CE, Christian era. And you start looking, all of these were predictions for the end of the world. And the dates kept changing and kept changing and kept changing. And so you go to the next page. 1921 to 1990. And you keep going. And of course, we've got ends of the world, 2020 and 2023, 20, uh, 26, 2029, 34, 2060. So we have all of those dates. Again, it's sort of reminding us over and over again. This isn't trying to tell you the date. This is not giving you information so you can predict, okay, now we know when the world's going to end. This is telling you a message about heaven, about God, about God's promises, about God's open door to us. And God's on that throne, surrounded by heavenly court. And whatever happens in heaven and on earth, he is the one sitting on the throne and he remembers that promise. He's not going to destroy the world and all of us. And he's committed himself to being involved in our lives. And that's the, what we need to remember as we begin our journey into the crazier sections of Revelation. So one final assignment, look at, just Google, how many hymns or just hymns that are based on Revelation 4 or hymns that refer to Revelation 4. And you might be surprised. Holy, holy, holy. That's pretty well. Let's see, Revelation 4. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And, and we go on with that. And at the moment, I'm looking at the Bible and I can't remember the song. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. All things have created. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. By the sea of crystal, love divine, all loves excelling. Praise, yeah, praise God from whom our blessings flow. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Great is thy faithfulness. 
shall we gather at the river? And it's the Crystal River again. So that's basically chapter four. So look up Greek theater, take a look at the, some of the clips from the movie to get a sense, then reread Revelation and not with all those little strokes of the little pin dots of what each symbol, but that broad, how is this a message of hope? Once again, I'm the Reverend Dr. Cheryl Gaver, and thank you for joining us for this week's um, look at Re the book of Revelation. Next week, we'll dive into chapter five. Thank you, take care, and God bless.